there were 20 new abortion restrictions, which were the most in a state in a single year since Louisiana in 1978. Um, I know that you are and have long been pro-life, but how do you feel about that level of activity being directed toward this particular issue during this session? Well, I mean, you can't ask, do you need one bill, two bills, or 20 bills that uh, reflect uh, pro-life uh, uh, values? And I looked at each one of those, and they sort of approached it at a different way. And so there's a rationale for each one of those. It might be protecting the health of the expectant mom. It might be uh, uh, making sure that there's a connection to a hospital for an abortion facility. So each one of them had their own uh, basis for it. Uh, of course, the biggest one was one that was is clearly currently unconstitutional in that it uh, uh, would reverse Roe versus Wade, but we've seen the Mississippi case go to the Supreme Court, so they are going to revisit that. Ours is still uh, even stronger or more, uh, uh, more pro-life than what they passed in Mississippi. So, you know, you have to look at each one of those, and uh, obviously the Supreme Court's going to have to address this issue, and Arkansas's voice uh, will be important uh, as we pass so many different uh, pieces of pro-life legislation. There were also pieces of legislation passed that impact our elections and how they're run, uh, voter ID, uh, electioneering at the polls, reducing the number of early voting days as well. We've seen this really not just in Arkansas, but around the country, and critics of these laws describe them as voter suppression. Is it voter suppression in Arkansas? I don't think so. Uh, to me, there's two fundamental uh, principles of voting. One is let's improve access, and we've done that through the years in Arkansas with greater access to early voting. We particularly expanded it during the pandemic. And the other one is voter integrity, where you make sure that the person who says they're voting is uh, responsible and, and uh, legally authorized to vote. And so you balance those two. Uh, they're going to be reviewed, but I think that the laws that were passed uh, accomplish both objectives uh, in making sure that we can have access, but also the integrity of the voting uh, ballot is uh, supported. Uh, Rex Nelson, who's with the Democrat Gazette, longtime member of the uh, GOP, wrote a pretty scathing column about the Republican lawmakers who, who dominated this session. I want to ask you about some of the personal shots uh, that he took at them, but I, I do want your reaction to one thing he wrote. He said that they spent this year's session introducing bills that dealt with divisive social issues that aren't even the business of state government. Is he right about that? Well, he's right in part because that's the reason I vetoed one of the bills. Uh, and then the second part is, uh, are we passing laws that address a problem or are they just worrying about what could happen? And that's a tough balance because you see trends nationally, so you want to protect Arkansas from some of those trends that we see as harmful. But, uh, you know, the best rule is let's wait uh, to address real problems because when you have real problems, you can have better solutions to those problems rather than just something theoretical. You mentioned about the voting. Uh, there's a couple, one of those that I did not sign, and that was uh, where it said you cannot uh, present your absentee ballots uh, on Monday. It has to be done earlier. Uh, I didn't think that was a good move. I didn't veto it, but I didn't support it as well. The Monday before Election Day, of course, we're talking about. All right, the governor once again, and we will hear uh, once more from him later in our hour. We welcome you back to our KATV, Your Voice, Your Future Town Hall, as we examine the 93rd Arkansas General Assembly with two more distinguished members of that body. Uh, she represents House District 32, which includes a portion of Pulaski County. This is first term uh, Democrat Ashley Hudson. And from Benton, Senator Kim Hammer, who represents uh, District 33, parts of Saline County and Southwest Pulaski County. He is also a pastor and a hospice chaplain. We thank you both for being here. Thanks thank for having us. Great thank to you. see you. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's talk about these cultural issues that, that really kind of help define this session and, and, and in some ways help define Arkansas for a lot of people around the country. And let's begin with those transgender bills. Uh, the governor vetoed that bill that prevented doctors from providing hormone therapies or gender reassignment uh, surgeries for people under 18. The legislature overrode that veto. Uh, Representative Hudson, what, what kind of feedback have you gotten from your constituents about that legislation. Yeah, um, and I'm glad you eased us in with something real easy to start with. So <laughs> thank you for do. that. That's what we do. Um, 
you know, the, it was interesting for me because often when you talk to constituents and you talk to your colleagues, sometimes you get different uh, perspectives depending on what region you're in. Um, I'm in West Little Rock, um, and so a lot of my constituents are, you know, live right here in Little Rock or in Pulaski County, and um, many of them, not not to a letter, but many of them were horrified. Um, and for a lot of reasons, not all for the same reasons. Um, they were worried about what this would do to Arkansas's perception on a national stage and how that might affect their ability to recruit employees. Um, I have a lot of physicians who work um, in, in hospitals here and who live out in West Little Rock who were concerned from the perspective of, uh, you know, whether this was going to be the first step in government starting to interfere more in other types of treatment that they provide to their patients. Um, and I had parents. Um, I actually had one set of parents who were both physicians and parents of a transgender son. Mm. Um, and both of them are uh, re well respected in their fields and they're thinking of leaving the state. Um, and I know we'll talk about healthcare and other things later, but when we're talking about draining that type of talent um, in the name of something that's really a solution chasing a problem that doesn't exist. Um, you know, you have to think in balance of whether it was worth it, and my constituents largely said no. In my interview with the governor, uh, Senator, he, he talked about the fact that, that allowing government to come between a patient and their doctor is actually kind of, uh, kind of flies in the face of, of conservatism, that it's really about uh, limiting government and empowering individuals. Uh, is he wrong about that? I would disagree with the governor to a certain amount uh, because when you look at what other nations have done in this particular area and they have a lot more advanced time of which they've offered this type of procedure, but they's all, they have also had the time to study the results that come with these procedures. And these other countries that were out ahead of us in doing this have started withdrawing from it and they themselves have started making it illegal. And when you look at what other nations are doing that have more experience at it than what you do, you have to learn from what their experience is and apply it to your current situation. As far as the constituency issue, uh, some of the individuals that reached out to us were not even from our area, were not even from our region. Uh, they were from other parts of the country, other parts of the world. With regards to the constituents that have reached out to me, I've not had that many that have felt alarmed by what we did, and therefore I think that you could look at it and say if other areas of the world are understanding that it creates problems, then why would we not step in and why would we not do something to address it so that we wouldn't end up where they are now? And I want to just real quick jump in on that because I think it's important, and we did this a lot during the session, we talked about procedures. Um, and, and the procedure is hormone therapy. There was a lot of, uh, you know, you talk about people coming in from out of state, there was a lot of um, you know, a, an effort to, to frame this as chemical castration of children. Um, and, and that's simply not what's happening. And we know that because our, our own professionals at the endocrinology cl clinic at the Arkansas Children's Hospital told us so. Um, and what they testified to when they come in and testify in committee is that what they're talking about is a hormone therapy that is completely reversible and it simply gives a teenager time to figure out um, what all this means, if they're transgender, if they're not, um, and it is used in other, it, it's used in other aspects. These types of hormone therapies are used to treat other types of conditions, and there's a real concern um, that some of the very fine endocrinologists in Arkansas will choose to leave the state if they're not able to practice um, in, in this way. So again, it goes back to, to not only talking about um, healthcare choices between uh, parents and their and their children, um, but also for looking at a at a brain drain by um, you know getting doctors to a point where they don't think that they can practice uh, freely. Uh, I could, I guess I have a question. It's more general about, and it's for people that don't understand the whole sausage making process of the legislature. But on a bill like the one we're talking on, other issues that were controversial in this legislative session. How much of it is there negotiation? Is there conversation behind the scenes to make changes to the bills? Um, it, when you know that there's controversy coming like that, how much of it is colleagues talking to each other and, and finding a way to find common ground versus I know I've got the votes or I'm, we're the majority party, we can do what we want to do. How, how much of that kind of goes on? Explain that process and what you guys experience behind the scenes, the stuff that doesn't always come out in public. 
You know, it all begins with an idea or it begins with a legislator who's been approached by a constituent or recognizes that there is a need or that there's a problem. And sometimes those problems are elsewhere and you want to be uh, preventive and those problems become your problem. So we create legislation to build a firewall. But once the process gets started, there is a lot of dialogue. I know that sometimes when people watch what they see in committee meetings or what they see going on in the chambers, they think that maybe we aren't talking, we aren't dialoguing. But for the most part, this legislative generation has always tried to find a pathway forward. Uh, not necessarily, you know, the word compromised is used, but I wouldn't know that, I, I don't know that I'd use the word compromise as much as it is just trying to find that common ground where you can move something forward. And sometimes you just reach an impasse where you just don't agree and it's a philosophical or it is a, uh, a difference that you just can't resolve your way around and then you go out and you get as many votes as you can yeah. and you, you do the best you can to get it through. Yeah, I think that's well put. I want to hear your perspective on it too because I think that's a part of the process people don't sure. see. I see it up close and personally as a reporter that's covering this stuff and talking to people on and off the record, but it is also... That's really where, as again, it's the sausage making process. It's where the sausage is made. Well, it, 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 you know, and I think too, um, coming into this brand new in this session, um, I was curious too to see how it worked out. And I think that in a situation like the Arkansas legislature in which you have a supermajority party, when you're talking about some of these hot button issues, these cultural issues that they have made, um, you know, part of their uh, party priorities, their party platform, there is no compromise, um, the, and, and respectfully, I say that. I mean, there's not because it's it's been a legislative uh, priority for them. They know they have the votes, and there's really not a lot of discussion about it. Now, um, there are certainly other areas where we can find uh, compromise. We can find compromise talking about um, taxes. We can find compromise talking about infrastructure and our home. And there was a lot of work, a lot of bipartisan work on our home. Um, but I think that, that the reality is um, that when you're talking about um, some of these, these big hot button issues that came in um, sort of ready to roll, um, there's not a lot of discussion. There may be some discussion personally where um, we as, as people try to understand each other's positions, but there's really not any, any budging. And sometimes there's not any, any way to budge. Um, mm -hmm. If you are, you know, if you've taken a position on, uh, you know, the transgender care, um, there's not really a way to, to, to find a compromise in that. Um, and, and so, you know, that's the reality of, of some of the, of the process. Political, philosophical lines mm -hmm. in the sand, basically, mm -hmm. is yeah. kind of what I'm taking away from that. Yeah. Um, we, we got a couple of questions from people through Facebook yep. ahead of tonight. Um, one, or one set particularly dealing with voter ID laws, which was another controversial subject in this legislative session. Um, at the end of the day, when you look at all of the comprehensive uh, changes that were made to election laws, I guess I'm going to ask each of you to tell me what you think was well done in that respect and what was not done well in that respect. Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> he wants rebuttal time, so it's good. Yes, the yes. This, is, this is what we do at the Capitol. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, in, in the courtroom, if you go first, you also get the reply. There but, you go. yes, <laughs> um, it, look, I am fully aware, based upon uh, my experience running for office, that a lot of these bills were referred to as the Ashley Hudson <laughs> yes. package of legislation. Right. I didn't say Not that. by yeah. me. No. I never did. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, I know that was the shorthand. And and I know that... And, well, and so people know, you, you won your election by 24, 24 votes. votes. 24 votes. And there were 27 ballots that were kind of contested and in question. And oh, you're so giving this me flashbacks. Is, yeah. 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 <laughs> right. uh, Just so our audience you is know, aware. Yeah. And so, so you know, we came, out of, we came out of a hotly contested race. And I know that, that as a result of that and as a result of some of the um, national momentum after, after President Trump lost... Um, that there was, again, a, a priority to try to get some of this type of legislation passed. But look, um, there are, there, there's been no evidence um, of, of any particular widespread fraud, either in Pulaski County or anywhere else in the state. Um, when, when you go through, and even when you have um, Republican or Democratic uh, clerks uh, who came in to testify or who were talking about it, there was, a small, there was a small portion of them that said, we have some concerns, but there was nobody who pointed to a particular issue and said this was a problem. And in, in my own race, as close as it was, there was never any um, allegation of fraud 
um, or, or anything of that nature. It was a, it was a tight race um, between a newcomer and a, and an incumbent, and and these things happen. We've yep. seen it with uh, Representative Elliott, Representative um, Godfrey, and and others who have who've come down to single digits in some cases, and that's part of the process, and it's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. Um, now, when you're talking about this legislation in particular, um, and I know that my colleague Senator Hammer here. Um, sponsored some of it and ushered some of it through, but I disagree with with the need for some of it. I don't think that um, telling people, you know, that they can offer a drink of water here but not here um, furthers the democratic process. Um, I don't think that changing the last day to turn in your absentee ballot from Friday to, or from Monday to Friday um, further advances the democratic process. We want more people to vote. We want more people to vote legally, and I understand that. But if there's no um, indication that they're not, then why aren't we focusing on other um, you know, policy priorities? So it's uh, automatic voter registration when you get your driver's license, things like that, if they encourage more voting. Um, and so it was a real head scratcher for me um, to see where the priorities fell in this session, um, especially because you know, I usually try to think of something backwards. What are we trying to do? Um, what are we trying to, to, to solve? What problem are we fixing? And I, I'm still not sure. To her point, Senator, of, of the 20 laws that were enacted on, on voting, uh, you introduced eight of them. What, what kind of led you to focus on this issue in this session? A couple things. Number one, we looked at what was happening in other parts of the country. In fact, uh, I actually interviewed a gentleman uh, from down in Benton who's an attorney that actually went up to Madison, Wisconsin, and worked on the Trump legal team and looked at some of the strategies that were being used up there in order to, dis to disenfranchise individual votes. And so we gleaned from what was happening from actual eyewitnesses that saw things happening. And what we wanted to do here in Arkansas for those of us that worked on the legislative package uh, with, the, with the election bills was to make sure we put in firewalls so that those things that happened elsewhere do not have a chance to happen here. And so that was based on eyewitnesses. Then the other thing is there are actually, uh, there's actually an investigation that is ongoing by the State Board of Elections right now that hopefully that report will come out in June. And that will really be uh, some of the uh, telling evidence, I think, as far as what happened in several elections in the state. And so knowing that that was coming and looking at some of the depositions that were taken from some of the cases, that's what a lot of the election laws were built around, plus interviewing some of the county election commissioners and some of the things that they experienced and the people that came in that were called in by county election officials in order to witness and to uh, investigate certain things. That's really what precipitated the majority of these bills was on the basis of those two things. I think when that investigative report comes back by the, county, by the State Board of Election, which we did beef up their authority to go and investigate because one of the third stool legs of the stool is prosecutors have the tendency not to investigate nor do they have the tendency to prosecute people on election issues because they themselves are dependent upon people in order to get voted into their office. And so when you throw those things in the mix, that really was the substance for why we looked at these key areas. And at the end of the day, Republican or Democrat, if you win or you lose, you want to know that you did it with the fairest level playing field possible. I think that's something we all ought to be able to agree on. All right. What was the best election law change in this session, each of you? <laughs> you can name one. You can name one. I want to tell you the one I think. It was Senate Bill 644. Uh, Senator Mark Johnson tried to get a pretty aggressive bill through, but what Senate Bill 644, which I think is one of the ones the governor didn't sign, gives us as a legislative body the authority to be able to determine and to look at investigation or to look at elections and it creates a pathway forward to make a recommendation to the state board of elections that they need to take over an election just like the state takes over a school that is failing. In that bill also was it establishes a hotline number at the attorney general's office so that those things can be turned in to an, to an unbiased party. That, I think, is probably the ones that I feel best about. As a about. former director of the State Board of Election Commissioners, I've investigated election fraud before. I'll tell you some stories when we get off air about okay. that. But what, <laughs> was, is there anything you could point to that Look you do think that. was an improvement in election law since you did monitor a lot of this closely? None of the Ashley Hudson bills, but I mean... <laughs> 
perhaps some of the others. I'm, I'm just sorry I didn't make it into the act. Um, <laughs> I, I thought Senator Tucker had had a good election bill that he was trying to get through to make it make it a little bit easier. Um, it, you know, just to functionally to try to get some of these ballots, uh, these absentee ballots dealt with. It didn't make it through. It didn't. Um, I don't even think it made it through committee. Um, I know that he tried to work. Um, well, I guess by the end, y'all y'all took it to the floor, and it took forever that one night, didn't it? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I hope it'll come back. I, you know, there was a lot of uh, uh, seemed to be a lot of um, uh, emotion on both sides of that in the Senate, but also it seemed like there was one of those situations in which maybe the senators needed a little bit more time to consider it and look into some of the uh, suggestions that he made. Um, and the process, I think, was was problematic in that case. So I hope he hope he's able to bring it back. We do know the, the League of Women Voters is going to court to challenge a lot of these new laws. What are your expectations for that? We had those bills reviewed by a couple of attorneys that are very savvy when it comes to election bills. I suspect that these will be frivolous lawsuits that eventually will be um, defeated. And But it's part of the democratic process. You just let things work themselves out and you, you just, you know, you let the system work. Okay. I want to end this segment on one other thing, because I know you guys have handled a lot of hot uh, potato yeah. issues in this one. I appreciate that very much, both of you. But um, all the easy stuff. Give, me your, yes. give, me your, <laughs> give me your best moment of bipartisanship that you witnessed in this last legislative session. I mean, you, could, you always it, turn it, to it, ladies it, first. It, that it, might it, be the hardest it, question it, of the night. We could be sitting at this table with each other tonight, because <laughs> no. you're still in session, technically. But... Um, well, I mean, we called the hogs on the floor one day. That's there you go. Yeah, yeah, we no, did that. I, you know, Nothing I, brings our yeah. cans together. Like exactly, a like a good hog call. I, you know, I, the work on our home, I thought, was yeah. really bipartisan. There were um, there were a lot of people um, working very hard um, to try to present that in both chambers and to also get uh, get buy-in from from all the members. And we had um, state agencies coming in and, and healthcare professionals and all these people coming in to try to talk. Um, to the members and also to try to um, really listen, uh, I thought, to some of the concerns that were expressed in some of the earlier drafts. And um, what came out isn't perfect, um, but I think uh, there, there are some good things in it. I know Senator Dismang mentioned a, a few of those and, and Senator Elliott as well. And, and so I think that we came out um, with something that's really necessary, that's really valuable to the state. I mean, when we've seen some of our neighboring states have uh, entire rural hospital systems shut down, we've only had two hospitals in the whole state um, over the past several years closed, and that's Almost it. because of fraud. So. That, yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. Um, but but also, it's um, it's a testament to the work that was done on the predecessors to this bill, and I was pleased to be a part of, of you know, working through a bipartisan solution to get this one through, too. I would say a couple things. Number one is we are fiscally sound. I think that under the leadership of the uh, of the speaker and the pro tem and the respective chairs of budget that we are a stronger financial state and we will be able to, and we're playing the long game when it comes to being able to lower taxes, but we don't want to be a state that gets in trouble and then has to come back and raise taxes. So one thing about, I think, the, the supermajority supported also uh, by some of the Democrats is that we are trying to play the long game as far as making our state a strong fiscal state because that attracts businesses, it gets our bond rating where it needs to be, and people can sleep better at night. Uh, I think the other thing is that at the end of the day, the legislative branch reestablished the balance of power. I think it's been, I think it, the scale has been tilted. I think that we have balanced it without going over to the extreme. And as a legislator, Democrat or Republican, I think we want to make sure that our voices are heard as one of the three branches of government. Did you ask the governor about that? Did he feel the same way that it's the, yeah, he, the, the balance of power? I'm not yeah, sure he yeah. would agree. But no, I, I, I know it is your first session. It's not yours. Did did the COVID pandemic kind of hanging over this session? Did that at all impact the sense of comedy, the sense of, of togetherness on the floor of the? of the Senate or the House? I think there was a real strong resolve on the part of leadership and all individuals, whether they were independent, Democrat, Republican, that we didn't want to do anything to harm our fellow legislators or our staff or the people in the Capitol. I think we just put our head down, plowed, did what we had to do, and at the end of the day, we knew we would finish the race. And when you look at how we finished, uh, with regard to the impact of the COVID on the legislative branch and the staff as a whole, I think we came out pretty good.
It was a unique time, no doubt about it. No doubt. Uh, Senator Hammer, Representative Hudson, we thank you so much uh, mm -hmm. for being with us tonight. Thank you for sharing your perspective. Good to see you both. Uh, when we come back, we'll look ahead to the fall, the official end of the session, redistricting, and that possibility of more tax cuts. That and more from the governor next.